From Sarasota Memorial and the Deb Kavanaugh Multimedia Studio, this is HealthCast, a healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about aortic aneurysms. Our guest today is Dr. Kristen Walker, a cardiovascular surgeon at Sarasota Memorial. Dr. Walker, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the basics. What is an aortic aneurysm? Well, before we talk about what is an aneurysm, we should probably talk about what is the aorta. Because it's hard to talk about disease if you don't understand the actual normal process. Correct. So if you think about the heart, it's nothing but a blood pump. Blood comes from your body to your heart, where it gets sent to the lungs for oxygen, and then it comes back to your heart, where it gets sent out to the rest of your body with oxygenated blood. Throughout your heart, there's a series of check valves that open and close to keep the blood going the right direction throughout the heart. And the last one of those check valves is your aortic valve. And that's the last valve that opens before the blood leaves your heart and then enters your aorta, which is the garden hose that takes the oxygenated blood to the rest of your body. So the first part of your aorta includes the valve, this kind of bulbous portion of the blood vessel. And then the two branches, the first two branches, are the arteries that feed your heart, the muscle of your heart, the coronaries. And then it becomes the ascending aorta where it ascends in your chest behind your breastbone. At the top of your breastbone, it makes a turn from front to back. That's the aortic arch. And then along your spine, after it makes the archway, it runs and becomes a descending aorta. So what I specialize in is the ascending aorta and arch mostly. I do operate on the descending. And the abdominal aorta where it gives off the blood vessels to your belly and your legs, that's mostly vascular surgery. So we're going to be talking mostly about the aorta and the chest and specifically the ascending aorta. An aneurysm is any blood vessel that's one and a half times or more average. So the average diameter of the aorta is two and a half to three and a half centimeters is pretty small. So standard about four and a half centimeters equals an aneurysm. So if you have an aorta that's greater than four and four and a half centimeters in diameter, which is about like that, then that's considered an aneurysm. So where are most of these aortic aneurysms located in that whole aorta? In the whole aorta, overall, if I looked at the entire aorta, the majority are in the abdominal aorta. It is much more common than in the ascending aorta, but the thoracic aorta is what I specialize in. Why are they called silent killers? Why are these aneurysms such maybe an unknown killer? Well. The scary thing about aneurysms is they're typically completely asymptomatic. You don't have any idea you have it. It's just a slowly growing vessel. And and it typically doesn't cause pain or discomfort until there's a problem with it. So so it can be known as a silent killer because people don't know they had it until it became a problem. Now, why is it a problem if if in diameter the aneurysm or or the aorta is wider than it should be? That kind of sounds like it would be a a good thing if it's pumping blood. You would think, you would think, but it has to do with wall stress. So when you remember, this is the first part of the aorta, the ascending aorta, is taking a lot of stress from your heart because your heart is a really strong muscle. So as it ejects the blood through that aortic valve, your ascending aorta actually distends. So when I'm looking at an aorta in the operating room, I'm watching it go like this with the heartbeat because it's, it's distending with every ejection from the heart. If it gets bigger and bigger, the bigger it gets, the more the wall stress is. And so then the weaker it gets. And then one thing, well, we'll talk about this later, but if you have issues with your connective tissue, it's especially weak and can get tears in it. So how do these actually develop? Yeah, it's a great question. If I knew the full answer, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. (laughs) There is a genetic component, we are pretty sure, with at least in the thoracic aorta, there's a genetic component. We're pretty sure there's at least 20% of those have some form of familial inheritance. Um, Other risk factors, hypertension, high blood pressure, especially poorly controlled high blood pressure. Like I was talking about the stress from the heart and the ejection puts a lot of stress on that wall and so it can over time weaken. Um, Smoking is a really big risk factor. And then to some extent in the thoracic aorta, in the chest, the atherosclerotic disease, high cholesterol plays a role. That is definitely a bigger role in the abdominal aorta but to some extent, having high cholesterol can contribute to it. The aortic valve that we talked about normally has three leaflets. So it's three little guys that open and close and they come together and don't let blood go the wrong way. There is a common, relatively common congenital abnormality called a bicuspid aortic valve. Mm -hmm. So rather than having three leaflets, they only have two that open and close. And those put you at specifically at risk for having an ascending aortic aneurysm. We think that it has to to do with a, a congenital 
variance, abnormality, that, that causes the entire ascending aorta and valve to be abnormal. So with those associated risk factors, there's only so much you can control. You can quit smoking. You can. Um, you can work to lower cholesterol if you have high cholesterol. Are there any other things you, you tell patients that can help keep their heart, keep their aorta healthy? Yeah, well, so like you said, blood pressure control is huge, keeping blood pressure under control. There are specific connective tissue disorders that, that put you at really high risk of complications with an aortic aneurysm, Ehlers-Danlos, Lloyd Steeds, and specifically Marfan's disease. All of those, we recommend patients being on a, a beta blocker, so a medication that lowers your blood pressure and your heart rate, because lowering your heart rate and your pressure decrease the wall stress on the aorta. Um, and then a angiotensin receptor blocking has been shown to decrease risk of complications with the aorta. So if you have a connective tissue disorder or you know your family has connective tissue disorders, you need to be talking to your, your primary care doctor about good blood pressure control. Because it's not just blood pressure. You did mention that there is likely some other genetic component. If you know that a family member has had an aortic aneurysm. Is that a conversation you should be having? 100%. So we do recommend screening in first degree relatives of somebody who has an aortic aneurysm. So if you have an ascending aortic aneurysm and you have children or brothers and sisters, or even maybe your parents, they should get screened, especially because the risk of having an aneurysm increases with age because the longer you have the wall stress on your aorta, the bigger it gets. It's natural for your aorta to get bigger with time. It does actually grow with you as you as you age, but it does not grow normally to an aneurysm size. Frequently, it's an incidental finding. So a patient will go to the ER and have a cough or chest pain and they'll get a CAT scan and the ER says, did you know your aorta was big? Or they can be getting an ultrasound of the heart, an echo, and they can notice that the aorta is enlarged. It's a common, common presentation is I had no idea I had it till I got some study for something else and they found it. How quickly do aortic aneurysms progress? Usually they're slow. In general, they're slow. Um, if you have Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Lois Dietz especially, it can grow a little faster. And, and those patients are at risk of complications at a smaller size. So generally in, in a normal I shouldn't say normal, and somebody who doesn't have a known connective tissue disorder and they have no other issues with their heart, no other reason to operate on their heart, we would watch them until they were bigger than about five or five and a half centimeters, depending on the patient. But in a patient with a connective tissue disorder, we would start talking about intervention early because they're at higher risk of complications. What does intervention typically look like for these patients? It's about as big of an operation as you can get. So. In general, if it's the, the aortic root, what I talked about, that's the valve and the first branches of the aorta, there isn't really a good endovascular procedure for that yet. That is big, open, what, what people generally consider open heart surgery. So you come to the hospital, you undergo general anesthesia. Um, I get what's called a transesophageal echo in the operating room. So we have a whole heart team that works with us. We have the same nurses and anesthesiologists in our cases every day. So our anesthesiologists are specially trained to do echo through your, your esophagus where you swallow. So that gives me a good look at the aortic root and the aortic valve to make sure I don't need to intervene on the valve. Um, after they do that, then we do our operation once we know what we're gonna need to do. Um, so it's we go through the breastbone. We have to put you on the heart and lung machine. I have to stop your heart to do the operation. And then depending on which part of the aorta we're operating on, we either replace it or sometimes we can repair it if it's the root and it's just a little big and the valve is okay. Um, that's just a, a conversation that we have based on the patient and the imaging findings before we make it to the operating room. Are there risks or any reason that you would choose repair over replacement or, or vice versa? For sure. So if we're talking about the root specifically, because there's not really a great way to repair the ascending. In the ascending, we just cut it out and put a new one in. And it's, um, it's a piece of Dacron, it's woven cloth that's impregnated with some collagen to prevent it from leaking. It looks like the tube portion of a tube sock. That's what we replace the ascending with. Uh, but the aortic root is a little different because this is how the blood gets to your heart. And so the root is this bulbous portion. So we have a special graft we use to repair or replace it. Um, and if we need to repair the valve, we can sometimes repair the valve if it's not leaking too badly. But if the valve is really calcified, like a bicuspid aortic valve, they are really prone to calcification. Um, they're really prone to leaking. And, and 
to getting what we call stenotic. So instead of opening all the way, they don't they don't open all the way, they just open a little bit. And so then your heart has to work harder to eject the blood. And so if I can't save it, then that's when I would replace it. I know you mentioned before that there aren't really any good endovas endovascular options yet. In the ascending. In the ascending. But the arch and the descending, we're getting there. Okay. Um, is that ever a good option for patients right now? For sure. So much like the abdominal aorta, the vascular surgeons are doing endovascular operations, procedures for the, the abdominal aortic aneurysms. We have really good options for the descending thoracic aorta. And sometimes in the arch, depending on if the patient has had a prior surgery, we do special surgeries. So if I have a patient who has an aneurysm that extends from the, ro the root all the way out the arch, I can replace all of it. The, the branch vessels to the head and neck, or even just there's normally three branches of the arch. Even if I just bypass the first two branches, there's a really good endovascular option to, to prevent having to go through the chest to repair a descending or arch aneurysm. Why is that a better option for patients who, who can go with it, aside from the obvious of not having to cut through the chest? Correct. You don't have to cut through the chest if it's in the descending in the arch. It's, um, it, it can be, it's obviously less pain, back to work faster. And patients, well-selected patients, it's a, a good option. And some people, it's not possible if there's not what we call a good landing zone. So we need healthy aorta to put the graft into so that blood doesn't leak around the graft and cause a bigger problem. So how do you decide with patients when endovascular is an option? How do you decide with them whether or not that's the best option for them or surgery, even though it sounds scarier, is truly the best yeah. option? It's a really, it's a, a candid conversation with the patient and also in conjunction with our vascular colleagues. So I work with vascular, so we, we look at all the imaging and if there's more that needs to be done in the rest of the aorta and they think that they can handle it endovascularly, we may recommend that option. If they think it would be better handled with me operating in the chest and then them coming later and doing it, the rest endovascularly. So it's a, it's a team approach, including the patient and the patient's family about how we would repair it. And is ongoing surveillance without surgical intervention ever a hundred percent or the best option? It is. It is. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And anytime we operate, there's real risks, especially in, in aortic surgery. There's risk that you could have a heart attack from aortic surgery, stroke, lung failure, kidney failure, paralysis, issues with swallowing. There's real risks with aortic surgery. But that said, the risk of a uh, uh, a complication from your aneurysm, that needs to be weighed. So as the aorta gets bigger, I guess we should probably talk about what is a complication with an aneurysm. Why yeah. is it a big deal? <laughs> so the most common complication that we see with an aortic aneurysm is called an aortic dissection. Most people, I, I think the general population, when they hear the word aneurysm, the first thing they think is, oh my goodness, my aorta is going to explode and I'm not going to know. And that's typically not how it happens. Aortic rupture is pretty rare. What does happen is this dissection. So if you think about it, there's three layers. We think of it roughly as three layers to the aortic wall. And you can get a tear in that innermost layer that then allows blood to dissect the layers apart. And so blood, you have this tear and the blood is going down in the path of least resistance into this place in between the layers of the aorta where it shouldn't be. And as it does that, it can block blood flow where it's supposed to be because this starts getting bigger and bigger and pushes down or it can weaken the outer, law, outer wall, and that's when it could cause rupture. So an aortic dissection in the ascending aorta is a surgical emergency. That's a do not pass go, we're going straight to the OR. It's one of the few remaining cardiac surgery emergencies that we have. Um, so that's why we talk about operating early in people with connective tissue disorders who are prone to dissection at smaller sizes than the general population. Or once you get to bigger than five and a half centimeters, we start talking about risk benefit of dissection versus operation. The risk of a dissection once you're greater than five and a half centimeters is about 12% a year. It's not small. And so that's why we talk about it because we have to weigh it against the risk of stroke or other complications. If you have a smaller aorta, but you have a connective tissue disease and you are also a relatively healthy person, active and a good surgical candidate, we will talk about surgery earlier. What are the most common misconceptions that you hear from patients when they're diagnosed with an aortic aneurysm? They panic about rupture. They think their aorta is going to explode. And frequently I have patients coming to me telling me, doc, I'm terrified to do anything. I can't exercise. My PCP told me to stop going to the gym. I'm just sitting on the couch 
scared. And, and it's really a little bit um, inaccurate to think that you can't exercise. I tell my patients with aneurysms, I want you exercising. It's good for your cardiovascular health. I don't want you lifting heavy weights. And I don't give people a weight limit because what's heavy to me is not heavy to you. So if you have to strain to lift something, I tell patients, don't, don't strain to lift things. But I do want you doing strength training, especially females, so that they can keep their bone health up. Um, but lower weights and higher reps. It is important to continue to exercise and, and not, you know, just sit around out of fear that your aorta is going to explode. Because that can also impact other things like blood pressure, Correct. which is negative. Correct. Right. After treatment, say someone has surgical repair or replacement, um, are patients at risk of future aneurysms? Well, not in the part that I cut out because I cut it out. So the part that's been replaced is done. That's over. There is a risk of having complications with the rest of the aorta. We consider it, and especially if you've had a dissection, it's a whole aortic disease. It's not a disease of just the ascending aorta. So there is a, a risk of continued, what we call aneurysmal degeneration or, or growth of the remaining aorta. So yes, there's a small risk. There's also a risk of where we cut out the aorta, those suture lines, we have to sew that back to normal aorta. We have to use fancy, basically like fishing line to sew it together. That, we, that suture line can get weak and could leak a little. So they need ongoing surveillance annually, even after surgery. Is there anything else you wanna add? Anything you think it's important for people to know? Well, I think we covered a lot of the big topics. You know, I, if, if you have a family history of aortic aneurysm, or if, if you're concerned, I think people should talk to their primary care doctor. Um, and certainly, if you've been told you have a dilated aorta or aneurysm, come see me and we can talk about it. Because I, I see patients just for their surveillance, even before they meet indications for surgery. A lot of it is to make sure that I capture them when they're ready for surgery and that they're not waiting too long, but also to help alleviate some fear that goes along with with knowing you have an aortic aneurysm. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Walker, thank you so much for being with us today and answering all these questions. As always, we encourage everyone in our community to visit smh.com to get the latest from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.